I'd like to introduce our panel, which is Teresa Heggy from Freeline Therapeutics, Galia Levy, from the Chief Medical Officer for Spark Therapeutics, Amir Nashat, the managing partner of Polaris Ventures, and Sunit Varma, Global President of Rare Diseases for Pfizer. So one of the reasons that we're uh, we're focusing on hemophilia, there are uh, it has always been a uh, attractive target for gene therapy, partly because small levels of um, of the uh, missing clotting factor can make a big difference in the clinical presentation. One of the things that makes gene therapy for hemophilia uh, a unique among blood diseases is it's one of the blood diseases where the defect is not in the blood cells, and therefore you have to find a way of expressing the, um, the clotting factor that you're trying to replace, either factor eight or factor nine, uh, in, in the liver and in a different cell type so that it requires in vivo uh, gene therapy rather than manipulating hematopoietic stem cells. For the last 40 years, there had not been a whole lot of progress in beyond giving uh, uh, clotting factors, uh, isolated clotting factors to patients with hemophilia A and B. And in the last decade, there's been an explosion of changes with new therapies and also the, uh, the beginnings of gene therapy. And so um, we will focus on the questions around those issues. So the first question um, for uh, Gallia is, unlike other diseases where gene therapies uh, are being developed, there are lots of treatments that have come online in the past few years for hemophilia, and none of them are perfect, and none of them, including gene therapy, is really a cure. And so I was wondering where you think new gene therapies fit into the therapeutic landscape. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to participate. Um, as you said, none of the uh, none of the therapies that have been developed are a cure or is a cure. And and yes, there has been a lot of fantastic innovation in the hemophilia space in in the last few years. We know that. Um, Obviously, a cure would be the ideal therapy. Uh, other than that, we know that there's not really one therapy that is the perfect choice for any given patient. And I think I've been humbled many times in my career in thinking that I understood what patients would want and 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 going out and um, talking to them, realizing that they uh, many of them want different things. So uh, some people are really focused on wanting to forget their disease and, and not have to live with it, not have to think about it. And and for them, that those people, a one time, a once and done therapy is is probably the ideal. Others feel differently. Actually, you know, I've been surprised to um, to hear that 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 others feel differently from that. So. It's going to be about all the different things that the gene therapy can bring, the, um, the level of protection that it can bring, the mode of administration, um, you know, how well it's controlling the disease, what it's going to require in order to, uh, to go through the process of having the treatment. All of these things are going to play into whether a patient or a physician wants to choose a given therapy. I think our job is to design the best clinical trials that allow us to provide people with exactly that information and um, all of the, the information on the benefits and the risks and the differences between other therapies that will allow them to make that informed decision. Great. So Sunit, um, since the hemophilia space is, as we've already mentioned, uh, not only is the, uh, the the clinical armamentarium diverse, but the space for gene therapy is also a bit crowded. So what are the key things that uh, are differentiating one from another? And what has uh, Pfizer learned so far about this process that is influencing how they move forward? Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you for the question. And thanks again uh, for having us and having me. Um, I think it's a really interesting question because you can look at it as a crowded space or you can look at it as a well-developed market with, a, as you said, a full armamentarium of, of, of choices or options for patients, which I think is wonderful. And we really believe that gene therapy will expand those choices, expand that armamentarium. And so that Pfizer in particular 
and I think in the market overall provided by the industry, we really want, you know, heme and heme B, you know, choices. We want all modalities, small molecule, large molecule, and gene therapy. Um, we want with and without inhibitors, et cetera. So I think we look at it as this is all uh, giving the patients the choice that we think that they deserve. And we know that there is still need. You know, there are peaks and troughs. There are people who see a quality of life impact. There are things that patients are trying to manage. And so when you put the totality of that together, uh, we see that there'll be a, a full range or spectrum of choices that patients can choose from. And we've seen that, you know, that burden can actually lead to less than desired number of, of patients adhering to even prophylaxis regimens. So I think that this really expansion is a good thing and uh, gene therapy will be part of it, but you're right. Uh, as Dr. Lewis, it's not for everybody. It's not a cure. It'll be, uh, it, people will choose the innovations that recently come on the market or the ones that are, are forthcoming. I think within Pfizer, what we've really seen lately are, um, you know, we have some new models of collaboration that have really been important for us to move forward in the gene therapy space, things that are new to uh, Pfizer uh, in general. For example, we obviously want to develop medicines. We want to deliver them to the market, but our discovery model is actually different. So we have a, have a build by partner strategy. So some things we're building ourselves, some things we're uh, acquiring in the market, and some things we're partnering out. And when we look at our pipeline, it's about a third, a third, a third. Now, that's very different for a big company like Pfizer. And that's something we've learned that in order to keep pace with what is frankly one of the most pioneering areas of science, that we need to have a different approach to how we discover and ultimately develop them uh, and bring them to market. So I think that's uh, one learning I could share. And the last thing, uh, Dr. Lin, I'll share is what Pfizer has learned from COVID has also been really interesting in its application to rare disease. Some practical things like cold chain uh, delivery were already under, uh, under development in Pfizer for gene therapy. We applied those to our uh, COVID vaccine and actually took it to, to market. So it's actually now operational. And now it gets handed back to our gene therapy in full form or finished form of how we can do it. So that is a great learning. And that's sort of a collective advantage, I would say, that we can benefit within a company, but also across our industry as all of us look to grow uh, the gene therapy space. Lastly, I'll just highlight engagements with regulators. I think we've seen there's a totally new way that we can learn to engage, you know, to engage and to move these things forward. We, you know, we were seeing overnight reviews of protocols. We were seeing reduced IND filing times. I think that those learnings tell us that we can do things better and faster in the rare disease space as well, especially gene therapy for hemophilia. Great. So Amir. How do you view the uh, competitive landscape for specifically hemophilia as opposed to other, uh, other diseases? And uh, what do you see as investor priorities for rare, rare hemologic disease? Sure, no, it's a, it's a great question. I think unlike other, the, maybe the first generation of gene therapies and investments in those companies, I, I think hemophilia represents an opportunity for gene therapy to show how it compares to and stacks up with other modes of therapy. In many of the other areas that we've invested in companies and created companies, it was really, there was no other available options. It was just first, first to the finish line um, was kind of the mentality. Here, you do have to show how within a pretty advanced, you know, pretty developed uh, treatment landscape, these therapies have a completely different way of helping patients and, and changing their lives. And, um, to the points made earlier, some patients will, you know, will really go for that, and it'll change um, their lives in a meaningful way, and and they'll prefer it. I think that in as a new company, you know, which is somewhat what we tend to focus on, um, for new companies, hemophilia was a great target for a long time because it allowed you to prove your gene therapy platform. If I was going to look at starting or investing in a new company today, hemophilia would be an interesting place to think about this idea of long term because you know these are very chronic and uh, trying to focus on problems such as could you do repeat dose after you know two three years um, is that required now we'll see how the clinical results come out and it's possible that you know one shot is all it takes but I think for patients that are used to taking a drug every other day you know two three times a week um, obviously with him Libra it's a little bit you know uh, once a week or once a month being able to take a shot once every two years is a massive difference in quality of life. And so I think there are some really interesting technical things that companies could overcome that would change gene therapy um, 
as it's currently viewed today, um, as either it works forever or it's not a really good therapy, um, not that successful, and would be very useful in other therapeutic areas. So I think the question to kind of answer or validate as an entrepreneur is different in hemophilia today than maybe it was a decade ago. Uh, but I think there are still some really important problems to solve. And I think it's a great place for the technologies to show what they, what they bring to the table. Great. I think that's a great point. If I can add to that, I think the, the um, hemophilia is a place where it's, it's pretty easy to see whether your gene therapy is doing what it's supposed to be doing. We have good biomarkers. We have good efficacy endpoints. There's still a lot of things that need to be solved in gene therapy, the immune response being a major one. And, and trying to do this in hemophilia, gene therapy will be really a place where we will be able to try to tackle this problem and really see if we're making headway. And I think that will translate to all gene therapy, which is another benefit of going in this, um, in this area. Great. Well, that, that leads right into the next question, which is that there have been some long-term safety concerns about gene therapy for hemophilia uh, and targeting the liver and other potential problems. So Teresa, how should the field deal with that moving forward? Yeah, it's a great question, thank you. And you know, we've been talking about um, patient preference and physician preference and, and efficacy is one part of that, but certainly safety is another important consideration, especially when there, there are existing therapies that are effective, but in many cases have a, uh, have a high burden of, of, um, of treatment. So I guess the first thing I would say is that um, in general, gene therapy has a very good record of, of safety. If you look at, there have been in general very few um, reports of, of adverse events, and I think that's, that's very promising. I think the other thing I would say is that um, if you think about safety, you need to think of it in the context of benefit because this risk-benefit ratio is not only important to regulators as we continue to see, but we know that it's very important to, to adoption. So the adoption of, of therapy will depend very much on um, both the, the, the efficacy that you're delivering, but, but the safety in light of that. And I guess that's why certainly for us as a company, we're continue to be committed to, to functional cures. We think that's the real promise of gene therapy. And, and we're very fortunate that we were founded on the basis of a very potent capsidin platform that we think delivers um, protein levels high enough to get patients into the functional range. And, um, and, and certainly, you know, we started, as Amir said, you know, we started in hemophilia as well. It's a, it's a relatively uh, easy therapeutic area to deliver, um, meaning you have, you know, relatively lower levels of protein that need to be delivered. <clears throat> But having said that the, you know, the safety profile of gene therapy in general is very favorable, we do continue to see um, reports of, of adverse of events. And I think the responsibility that we all have is to look at those very carefully. I think the level of investigation has to be very high. It has to be rigorous. And there has to be great transparency. And I, I think that's what we've seen, actually. And I think that's important not only to keep the pace of innovation going because whenever you see these and there's an investigation or a pause or a clinical hold, that really means that we're slowing down the rate at which we can deliver these fantastic innovative products uh, to patients. But, but it is right that we, that we should pause and, and try to understand them. Um, and I think you know, the other thing beyond you know, looking at um, and investigating these, we need to think carefully about patient selection and clinical studies. And that's a tricky one because on the one hand, you want as many patients to benefit from the innovation and the promise of a, of a functional cure and, and balance that with patients who might have underlying disease that could confound um, the, the safety profile. So I think that's another area that we should all continue to, to look at very carefully. There's no easy answer to that, but, um, but we, we need to be thoughtful about that. And I guess the, the last thing I would say, and this is a complex topic that of course I could talk a lot about because I'm so passionate about it, but the way we think about safety is 
in a, in a simple way is the combination of potency and quality. And I think across most medicine, potency is good. You're delivering less drug to get the benefit. And I think most people would acknowledge that, that that's a good thing. It's particularly important, I think, let's say with, with AEV gene therapy, which is what Freeline is, is involved in. From the beginning, we thought that potency is really important um, because you're not only delivering what you want to with AAV gene therapy, but there's a, there's a chance that you're delivering unwanted uh, DNA as well. And so our mission continues to be to focus on our very potent capsid and platform, but, but also to continue that mission. And in addition to choice of capsid, and I think for the industry to look at developing even more potent uh, capsids, is all the choices around manufacturing. Um, and, and by that I mean, you know, the choice of manufacturing process, the cell line, all of the components. And this is maybe one area that we've not focused on sufficiently as an industry, which is really sharing what are the, the, the biggest drivers of potency and quality so that we can all benefit um, from that. Um, and then quality, I think, is just, you know, mostly it's about a mindset, but it's also a responsibility to deliver the analytics that can help to characterize um, the DNA. It, it's also this mindset of quality is about having continuous discussions with regulators um, to try to help navigate our way through this because it's such a rapidly evolving um, field that I think the partnership with regulators and um, learning together and really um, sharing experiences is, is tremendously important. Great. D D Dr. Berliner, it's, mm -hmm. it's Sunit, if I could just add to that, because I think that uh, Teresa and I would share the view that the industry is committed to the long-term safety and we are uh, conducting long-term follow-up studies. Yes. And, and every, you know, in our studies, we're already at five years for the patients. We're on our way to 10 and some regulators and authorities are talking about 15 years. So I think given the dynamism and the newness of this area, we absolutely have to commit as an industry and we are committed to that long-term follow-up and investigation. I mean, inside Pfizer, we say you can't buy time. So at the end of the day, these are gonna take time as we wind through those and, and learn together. Absolutely. So uh, Galia and Sunit, this is for both of you. What um, we know that there are huge numbers of hemophilia patients in the world who have don't have access even to factor support, much less uh, other more sophisticated therapies. So, what do you think the opportunities are for delivering gene therapy in low and middle income countries? And what efforts are you making to address the issue? I'm going to start with Galia. Sure, and this is a really important question. And I think in hemophilia in particular, there's really a uh, huge potential benefit of gene therapy in these countries where, unlike what we said at the beginning, there are a lot of therapies available for hemophilia in the high income countries, in the low and middle income countries, that is not the case. And, and many patients are foregoing prophylaxis because of that. So I think you know the, the opportunity to have a, a one-time treatment can be really the, the solution to the, the issue in these countries. Getting there, I think, is complicated. And uh, obviously, what's going to be needed is it's, um, you know, it's multi-pronged. It's figuring out what, um, it's really centering around innovation and needed in supply chain logistics to get these products to, to patients in those markets, lowering the cost, improving the stability, storage characteristics, so figuring out how to do this at room temperature storage rather than, than um, minus 85, working with, um, with other organizations, NGOs, funders, to find creative ways to, to fund therapies like this in, in these countries and to decrease the, um, the overall cost of the, the totality of the treatment. So the product plus the administration plus the monitoring it might require in the logistics. So there's a, there's a lot of work to be done on this front. I think we're starting with the technology aspects, mass production at lower costs and stability, and those will help with the other issues that are at play and um, help overcome those barriers. This isn't gonna be overnight, but I think um, there is a path to get there and we should all be collectively looking towards that. The other thing I'll say is um, 
as uh, I, you know, I'm proud to have been part of the development of Hem Libra in my prior job. And with Hem Libra, we, um, or Roche has now approval in 101 countries and 77 countries with access in less than four years since the uh, first approval. So that is that's tremendous compared to what has been the case with um, with prior products in the space. And so Spark being part of the Roche Group, we one share that philosophy of trying to have broad access for patients. We really believe in that and doing everything we can. But we also really hope to learn from those learnings that the the um, the hemophilia team has had in making that a reality. Okay, great. No, that uh, that's really inspiring story. And I'll just add a bit uh, to it because I think we both have a passion for lower and middle income uh, nations. Uh, these are historically underserved, and we and we we know that in the industry. I think uh, when you think about healthcare systems, the systems capability, systems capacity, those are rate limiting factors in those markets. And so I think we're it's not just about price, which I think a lot of people think about, especially when it comes to hemophilia and gene therapy. There are many other uh, factors we need to manage. And so I, I would say that the way we're looking at that is, uh, let's say the infrastructure of care is really about public-private partnerships. So we need to work with those countries and those governments and between academia and the institutions of those countries and, and come up with ways uh, that we think we can handle the cold chain delivery, the way that we can um, deliver the care. How can we do the follow-up, et cetera? I mean, at the end of the day, um, it's about the people, and the most people actually live in those lower middle income countries. Therefore, that's where the patients and the families are. So we have to we have to crack that nut. And I think public private partnerships are, are that sort of triumvirate is, is going to be key on the payment model. Just to make a sense, because I'm not trying to ignore price. I mean, um, value that is an important feature, but I think that's where we need to reimagine the approaches to how we're going to do it. This is not a pay for prescription model. Uh, this is a, a totally different way to do it. And there are many innovative ways to look at pricing. And we're working with um, MIT New Digs on a new flexible payment models. And we have like several new and innovative ways that we're currently researching uh, to say, how could this work in the developed world, but also how would this work in emerging markets? Great. Nancy, if I can we're running. Go ahead. just a very quick comment, which is, one should look at gene therapy through um, not the lens of today, but 10 years from now. The price is going to be a lot cheaper. You know, this next decade is a decade of nucleic acids, whether it's RNA interference or antisense or modified RNA vaccines, et cetera. The cost of these of the base technology is going to drop dramatically. And the ability to treat somebody once a year, once every two years, once a decade, maybe once in their lifetime, is inherently going to be cheaper than trying to you know, treat them two, three times a week. And I think that for the idea that gene therapy is really a first world technology, you know, reserved for first world problems is, is actually, I think, missing the point. If, if it, once you see the cost curve drop because of the broad dissemination of technology, I think it could be a fantastic modality for, for all kinds of problems in our broader global population. So I, I just think we're looking at it through today's lens, but you know, if we were to imagine what the future could look like if uh, gene therapy cost one one hundredth what it does today, then it really opens your mind up to all the different things. And I think hemophilia will again be the test bed by which, you know, we can kind of see the future. Great. So we have about one minute left. Um, one of the, uh, there was some mention about academic and uh, um, industry uh, collaboration, and this is an open question. Whoever gets their uh, their voice out there first. Um, what should that look like in terms of trying to drive this field forward toward uh, a successful outcome? I guess I would, I'll jump in and say, uh, I think close collaboration because, and you know, that's been more challenging, I would say during COVID. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be here in person with one with a mirror here. And so we're we're getting there, but there is nothing like being, you know, with other people and sharing ideas and, and learnings. And, and I, I just think that we need to continue to do that. The pace of innovation is incredibly exciting. And I think it'll be even faster together than it is separately. Great. Okay, well, we've just about run out of time. There will be a question and answer uh, period that will come up shortly, but I wanna thank everybody on the panel for a really interesting discussion. 
and I'll see you back in a few minutes. <laughs>